Hello and welcome back to another video guys. In this video or video series we will look into the Tortoise TDS architecture and make a deep dive to fundamentally understand how the Tortoise TDS model generates speech. Since the Tortoise TDS architecture uses four individual models I decided to split this video up into four individual videos where we cover each of those models and I believe the Tortoise TDS architecture is really an awesome work by James Betker. I hope I pronounce his name correctly and he also is one of the co-authors of the Dolly 3 paper so I think even if you're not that interested in generating speech understanding how the Tortoise TDS model works and understanding the individual parts lets you understand how you maybe can do your own projects. The Tortoise model consists of an LLM specifically a GPT-2 model, a clip-like model a diffusion model and a vocoder. So in this video we will not only see how to use those models individually but also kind of as an ensemble to generate speech. And I hope those were enough words to motivate you to stay tuned and follow along this journey or this series of videos. And yeah, let's just jump right into it. But before we start, I have great news for you guys. One of you can win this NVIDIA RTX 3080 Ti GPU with 12 gigabytes of VRAM, 320 tensor cores and 912 gigabytes a second memory bandwidth. And what do you need to do to win this GPU? First, attend to NVIDIA's 2024 GTC conference and second, send me a screenshot as a proof of attendance. That's it. The GTC conference is happening online and in person. In case you haven't heard about the GTC conference yet, the GTC conference covers a wide range of topics in the field of AI, giving you a great idea of what's coming next in AI. There are more than 600 sessions and people from all major players in the field of AI like Matter, OpenAI, Google DeepMind, NVIDIA or Runway ML will be holding talks and sessions. And personally, I found the what's next in generative AI the fastest stable diffusion in the world, as well as the human-like AI voices, exploring the evolution of voice technology, talks very interesting. And yeah, good luck to everyone and don't miss out on this one. All right, and before we start, I want to first, for the rest of this video, give you an idea or like an overview of the overall architecture of the Tortoise TDS model, which we can already see here. And then we will briefly talk about those individual models. And then for the rest, I want to introduce you to MELT spectrograms, which you maybe haven't heard of, but they're very important for their Tortoise TDS model architecture. So we have a little bit of a theoretical background and I'll show you the latent space or what a latent space is, which is also a huge part of the Tortoise TDS architecture. And then in the next video, we will start with the autoregressive, where is it? Let me see here, the autoregressive model. And in case I haven't made that obvious yet, this is all accompanied by using code. So we really will code how their Turtles TS architecture works on a low level. So I promise you at the end of this kind of like course, you will be able to fully understand how the model given input text and uh, conditioning speech is able to generate speech that includes the text that we have given the model plus is spoken using the voice that we have given to the model in our reference samples. And this also brings us right away to the overall architecture. We can see we can define a text that we wish to generate speech for and we can pass conditioning clips which kind of tell the model what voice the speech should be spoken with. I also have shown this already in a previous video that you can use the Tortoise CDS architecture for voice cloning, meaning you just need a three to five, five second snippets of a particular voice and can then generate speech for that particular voice, which is very impressive. And now in the architecture, we can see that the conditioning clips are first converted to a melt spectrogram here. So we have a waveform input, which is kind of like a continuous signal, you can imagine it like that. And then we transform it to a melt spectrogram and I will later explain them in more detail. But the quick summary is they contain still most of the information that we have in our waveform, but are around a 256 times compression, which make them way more efficient on the data level compared to the raw waveform audio that we have here. And we will then pass this melt spectrogram to the autoregressive transformer, including the input text as inputs, in theory, we will pre-process both before we pass into the autoaggressive transformer, but more on this in part two, when we actually cover the autoaggressive model. And the autoaggressive model then outputs codes, and maybe that's the first very confusing part, where are those codes coming from, and what are these codes? 
So this one is the inference architecture, meaning we can see how the speech is generated. But during training, there is one model in this whole mix or ensemble that is not shown here, which is the variational autoencoder, specifically a vector quantized variational autoencoder. And an autoencoder usually does the following. So we pass our input, which in our case will be a mouse spectrogram, and then we downsample or encode our input to a smaller low dimensional code and have this as our encoder. And then we have a decoder who deconstructs our code to our output, which then is the same dimensionality as the input and would also be a MEL spectrogram. So given a MEL code or MEL token, we can reconstruct a MEL spectrogram. And what we achieve with this is having a lower dimensional code, which further compresses our MEL spectrogram. So again, we kind of save some compute by lowering the dimensionality of the input data. And you might be wondering now if those codes here will be in the continuous space and we are using an autoregressive transformer who generates tokens or we know it from ChatGPT as generating text. So that will be a mismatch, right? So this is where the vector quantized variational autoencoder comes into place where we can see here, we have this continuous space in which we encode our input data. And then we quantize to a specific embedding space, also called codebook. Um, that's why we call them mal codes or mal tokens. And these embeddings are learned and we kind of aggregate or quantize our continuous latent codes in this space to specific discrete embedding tokens or codes. So it's a little bit like a cluster, I would imagine this. So instead of having like a smaller circle where all different points could lay in, we just summarize them with one specific embedding that kind of represents all of them very good, which allows us to compress our MEL spectrograms to discrete MEL codes or MEL tokens. And in the case of the Turtles TDS architecture, those codes are a four times compression of the MEL spectrogram. So we even further lower the dimensionality of the raw audio. So we have 256 times compression with the MEL spectrogram and then times four with the MEL codes. So the MEL codes here are a 1024 times compression of our raw audio, which we have here as a waveform. And what this allows us, giving the text and the conditioning MEL spectrogram, our autoaggressive transformer can then, during inference, generate MEL tokens that correspond to the input text and the conditioning voice that we gave the auto regressive transformer. And I guess now you can relate where those codes come from. So during training, we generate these codes. So the model learns to predict them. And then during inference, we don't use the variational autoencoder anymore. And the model just gets the text and the conditioning clips and tries to generate or predict the corresponding codes or MEL tokens. And the autoregressive transformer used in the Tortoise architecture is actually a GPT-2 model. So the predecessor of the GPT-3 and the ChatGPT model. And this brings us to the second model, the CLVP or Contrastive Language Voice Pre-trained Transformer, pretty long name, and is similar to the CLIP model, which you might have heard of. It is a discriminative model, which means we pass, as we can see here, the codes to the CLVP model and the input text and the model returns, I can't really see it here, but it's a score, which measures the similarity between the codes and the text. And in practice, the autoregressive transformer usually predicts, depending on how much compute we want to spend, around 100 code sequences. And then with the CLVP model, we determine for each a score and only pick the, let's say, top four to top eight code sequences or MEL token sequences and process them further. So most of those sequences that we generate here, we won't further process. And now you may be asking yourself where these activation latents are coming from and why aren't we using the codes that we have generated here to pass them to the diffusion decoder. And this is called the tortoise trick by the author. So instead of using the codes, the author found that as an input for the diffusion decoder or like as a conditioning, the latent activations, so kind of the internal representations of the individual codes inside the autoregressive transformer are way more expressive and contain more information than the codes itself. So kind of imagine all your consideration in why you wanted to predict this particular token is stored in these activations, while in the code, it's just the result that you're getting, but you're not getting the thought process of why the code should be generated or predicted. And this is what we have in the latent activations. 
and therefore if we pass them to the diffusion decoder as an input we have a more expressive or informative input for the diffusion decoder. And what's happening here, as I described, we only picked the top, let's say four or eight sequences out of those generated code sequences. And instead of using the codes, we use the corresponding latent activations for each of those code sequences and pass them to the diffusion decoder. And kind of using the latent activations is called the tortoise trick. So yeah, I hope by now this whole architecture makes already way much more sense to you. All right, and now there are only two parts or two models left. One is the diffusion decoder and one is the vocoder. And for the diffusion decoder, we get the melt spectrogram, which characterizes the voice that we would like to generate speech for as an input. And the second input are the internal representations of our melt codes inside the autoregressive transformer, which are very informative and allow the model as a guidance to generate a mouse spectrogram again. As you can see, we have the waveform data level and then we compress it to mouse spectrograms, pass it in here. Here we are even four times more compressed on the mel codes level and then we use the diffusion decoder here to generate a mel spectrogram. So kind of four times super resolution or upsampling. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the diffusion model or diffusion decoder. And later in part four, we will look more into how the diffusion model then actually works and how we pre-process both signals or conditionings here. And then as a final part, which was actually not trained as part of the overall tortoise architecture. So this model was trained, this model was trained, the VQ variational autoencoder was trained. The only model that was not trained is this vocoder, which is a, as we can see here, Univnet vocoder. So this vocoder is just adapted from an existing work without further adjusting it or fine tuning this vocoder. And all we need to do is pass the generated mel spectrogram to the vocoder and then finally get our output waveform. That's pretty much the whole tortoise architecture, which in the next parts we will look on a code level how to actually run through this whole architecture. But I thought it definitely makes sense to first get a theoretical understanding how this all works together and allows to generate speech. And for the end of this part, I briefly want to talk about the melt spectrogram and the latent space because both are essential for the tortoise TDS model to be able to generate speech. And I already mentioned earlier that the melt spectrogram inside the tortoise TDS architecture allows a 256 fold compression of the raw audio waveform data. And one very helpful characteristic of the melt spectrogram is that it can reproduce the characteristics of human auditory perception in a very efficient format. And to get a better idea about this, Leland Roberts has written a very nice article. I don't wanna go fully through this six minute read, but kind of briefly show you this is kind of the raw audio signal that we have that we sample with a microphone and then we apply a Fourier transfer. I hope I pronounced this correctly. And what's basically happening is that our signal is composed of multiple individual frequencies. And there is a Fourier theorem that states that each signal can be decomposed by its individual frequencies that more or less compose this signal. So with the Fourier transformation, we can take our signal that we have here in the time domain and convert it to the frequency domain. There we can see the peaks for the individual frequencies that construct our signal in the time domain. And as you can imagine, while I'm speaking, our signal more or less is like constantly changing. So we don't have like a uniformly a wave when I talk that will be more like a sound like uh, but while I'm talking our signal is changing and we have different amplitudes so if I'm speaking louder we have let's say higher amplitudes like here and to kind of reflect this when converting our signal to the frequency domain we have smaller segments so I don't know maybe like a 0.2 second window or even less this is one window this is a second, that's a third, and we can then apply to each of these windows the Fourier transform that we saw here, so converting it into the frequency domain, and with that we get a spectrogram, which looks like this. And one thing that 
researchers have found in 1937, I think it was known before, but they proposed a unit of pitch such that the equal distances in pitch sounded equally distant to the listener. So it's based on the human hearing or human auditory system. And this is called the MELT scale, which is a logarithmic scale. So we as humans, we can tell the difference between lower frequencies way better than higher frequencies. And this is what the MELT spectrogram more or less does for us. So we have our continuous time signal and compress it in the spatial domain so we can see this is 15 seconds of audio just in one image. And neural networks or deep learning based models are able to achieve really great results using MELS spectrograms. So that's why they're used inside the tortoise architecture because it has shown in research over the years that MELS spectrograms are really sufficient when working with speech data. Okay, and now let's have a look at the latent space and why we need something like a latent space. And one great example is just thinking of unprocessed raw audio, which is very high dimensional. For example, a, a two channel stereo sound with a sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz and 16 bit precision consumes 44,100 times 16 times two, which equals 1,411,200 bits per second. And for example, the tortoise model was trained with around 50,000 hours of speech data. So now you can do the math and think how much that consumes to store all the audio data. And in comparison, if we have a 512 times 512 image with 8-bit depth, such an image consumes a total of 512 times 512 times 8 times 3, which is around 6 million bits. And yeah, this just gives us an idea that basically 4 seconds of audio is the same as such a 512 times 512 image. To overcome this, overall like in generative modeling or in deep learning, it is usually assumed that the high dimensional audio data or data overall can be effectively captured by a low dimensional representation, which is based on the manifold hypothesis. So it's kind of imagine somebody would ask you how a person would look like, you know, you wouldn't describe it in pixel and like we as humans work like in abstractions, right? So you would have some features like hair color, eye color, uh, I don't know, maybe shape of the nose, something like that, something maybe that's also unique and stands out. The idea here is that we don't use all the individual pixels or all the audio information, but we rather compress it into a smaller, low dimensional space in which only the significant features are captured. So here we could say it encodes the essential features or variation of factors, which is a little bit more theoretical in the high dimensional data. So for speech data, we could say such latent factors could be the intonation, the rhythm, pitch, timbre, or tone of a certain speaker or voice that we then capture in this low dimensional space. The hard part here is kind of how can a model learn this? And if we have a look again at the variational autoencoder, you can see an input image and we compress it to a lower dimensional space. And this is called the latent space because the code that we have here in this bottleneck after passing through the encoder has less variables to express what's what's basically inside this whole input image. So we need to be more efficient with how we use the parameters that we have kind of or variables. And based on this, we then also need to be able to reconstruct the image as good as possible. So instead of telling the model features it should learn with models like this, we are able to train neural networks that are then themselves able to learn expressive features or abstractions in this input data, in this high dimensional space. Yeah, and this kind of shows the whole idea of the latent space. Yeah, that we kind of can compress or encode higher dimensional data into a lower dimensional space. And that from this lower dimensional space, technically, we can take samples and reconstruct them to a high dimensional space. Whenever you hear something like a latent vector, the latent space, that kind of means we have a mapping from our input sources, which could be speech data, into a more lower dimensional space that compresses our input data and represents features in our high dimensional space very efficiently. Yes, and that's it for part one, where we saw the overall architecture of the tortoise model and got some theoretical background, which is very helpful for the upcoming parts. And in the next part, number two, we will look into the autoaggressive model and how to generate melt tokens. And this will be our first pillar for generating speech using the tortoise architecture. All right, I'm looking forward to seeing you in part two. Bye bye.